I'll, what we're going to talk about for the remainder of our time together, the rest of this week, is the, uh, the limits of Turing machines. Um, what exactly are they capable of and what are they not capable of? Uh, they are not capable of everything. Like There are some limits to what Turing machines can do. Um, and that's what we're going to try and get specific about this week. We do have homework due tomorrow, by the way. Check it out. And we are going to have one final quiz on Friday based on the homework that's due tomorrow. So check it out. Um, the limits of Turing machines is what our, our topic for the rest of the, uh, rest of the week. Just a little terminology that I said at the very end last time. A language which is accepted by a Turing machine is called recursively enumerable. And I mentioned last time, something I mentioned a few times is that actually Turing's whole concept of computation in terms of machines has sort of like a parallel, uh, parallel universe of people who um, had a completely different concep con conception of computation in terms of what they called recursive uh, lambda expressions or something like that. This, this was a whole, a whole parallel thing which is equivalent to Turing's uh, comp uh, idea but in, in completely different language and it looks totally different on the surface called the lambda calculus, which we are not going to talk about. But um, anyway, this term comes from that side of, of, of the history in which this, this term makes some kind of sense. It, it seems uh, out of the blue when you use it in a, when you're in the context of Turing machines. But anyway, this is what they're called. A language that's accepted by a Turing machine is recursively enumerable. And uh, we write L of M is the set of strings accepted by some Turing machine. Some Turing machine M. All right, L of M. This is the same way we, we've written the language of a machine. We always write it with the L. Something that's interesting about a Turing machine, though, is that other types of things, like NFA, DFA, even stack machine, they have some strings are accepted, and all the other ones are rejected. Actually, on a Turing machine, there are, we haven't ever mentioned this before, but actually there's a third category on a Turing machine of strings. So here is an example to demonstrate, and I'm going to give names to these states here. I'll call them one and two. Let's say this is my machine. And I have an accepting state. Welcome back. Let's say this is my Turing machine. It's a pretty simple one. And I would like to ask, um, what are the strings which are accepted Let's call this M, right? The language of M, that would be all strings which make you get to the accepting state eventually. Um, yeah? You said A, B to the N? No, only B. Only B? Uh, actually, the, this sort of back and forth thing might suggest that it, like A, B, and then followed by a B is accepted, or A, B, A, B, and then followed by a B. It's not so, though. If you look closely. Only B? Uh, it, this L here, if those were both R's, then what I said before would be true. But this L makes it a little strange. So OK, B is accepted. Can anybody give another example of another string which is accepted? Yeah? A, B, B. I think A, B, B is not accepted. The first A will get B read, it goes right, then it sees a B, it reads that B, but then the head moves left. This, this L makes it very strange. It's not that strange, but it's... Yeah, any string starting with B will be accepted here, because you start here, you see B, you go over here, and it ends and accepts, regardless of anything else on the string. If it starts with B, it will be accepted, right? 
It turns out any other string will not be accepted, although that's a little less obvious. But uh, LM, I'll write it this way, BX, such that B is <coughs> in A, B star. All right. Remember, the accepting state of a Turing machine works a little differently than for NFA, DFA. As soon as you arrive in the accepting state, the string is immediately accepted. Even if you never read all the way to the end, uh, which will be the case in this machine, if it begins with a B, you go here and immediately stop and accept, regardless, irregardless, the rest of the string. I like when people say irregardless, one of my favorite words. All right, this is the language of strings which are accepted. What if the string begins with an A? Check it out. What about, um, what about, I meant to write what about, uh, AB? What happens if it's just AB? Yeah? You can stop Yeah. Right. Like, you, it, it sort of makes an infinite loop here. Let's, let's just see. Um, I'm going to, I know we haven't done this in a while, but you can actually write it out. Remember how we used to write this out uh, in terms of the states? We begin in state one with AB on the tape. I'll put a blank over here and a blank over here. What happens is the uh, state one sees A, you go to state two and move to the right. So now it becomes B, A, two, B, blank, like that. We switch to state two and move one position to the right. Next, we're in state two. Over here we see a a B, so we're going to move back to the left and back to state one. It will say blank, one, A, B, blank. And now you can see these are actually the same, and so it's just going to continue doing this forever. All right? So this A, B makes an infinite loop. This is what I said, for a Turing machine, there's like a third category. It's not just accepting versus rejecting. Now you could say, this string is not accepted. That's definitely true. But it's, it's like rejected in a kind of a different way. It's not like the machine stops and says, I do not accept. It, it just goes on forever. Okay, and so when it comes to Turing machines, we have three categories. There's accepted, rejected, which is not this, and then there's strings which loop forever. So this does not count as rejected in the way that we're going to talk about this. Um, this one loops forever. What about... So are there any strings with, which actually are rejected? That is to say the machine just stops and, and says... Yes, AA would be straight up rejected here. That's because you'll go over to state two and then from here, seeing another A, there's no, uh, there's no other state to go to. So I would say AA is actually rejected and what I, mean, what I mean by that is the Turing machine halts in a non-accepting state. So for a Turing machine, when I say rejected, I mean specifically the machine actually stops in a state which is not an accepting state. Accepting means it stops in in an accepting state, of course. And then there's this other category of strings which loop forever. Those sets we have actually other notations for. So L of M, this is the accepting uh, strings, which in this particular example is AX, where X is in AB star. We also have R of M, those are the rejecting strings, where the machine actually stops and rejects. Anybody want to say in this case, what actually is that set? of strings which stop and reject. So AA is definitely in the set. Any, anything else? Um, the empty string A and AA for the last. Yes. He said the empty string and just A, just a. and AA followed by whatever, right? Because if you have AA, it gets stuck. and that's Or if you have the empty string or if you have just A, it gets stuck. But those are the only options. Would AX also? Not necessarily. Because if it's A followed by BB, then it then it's accepted, right? Uh, no. But isn't, yeah, that's what a, some of those things will loop forever. Some will halt and reject. Oh. Right? So that's the difference. So here I'm going to say this is, um, can I say just sort of two 
kind of special cases that I don't really want to talk about, but like this. BX, yeah, sorry, I copied it wrong. We said BX, not AX here. Thank you. All right. The rejected strings would be the empty string or just A or that set, AAX. And then what about the looping forever strings? These we're going to write with an F. F is forever. Unfortunately, L is for loop, but L is already taken, so I go F for forever. What would that be? So one example is AB. Yeah, AB followed by anything will loop forever because this, you see this little loop here, doesn't care if there was other stuff after this B, it doesn't even matter. It will still have the same behavior. So this is AB followed by anything. All right? And I think if you look at these, these three sets, they, they include every possible string, right? We have the empty string and just A. Just B is part of this set. And then anything else, if it starts with a B, is accepted. If it starts with an AA, it's uh, rejected. And if it starts with an AB, it loops forever. So that's it. That's it. We have completely described um, those. Uh, for every string, we know if it is accepted or rejected or loops forever. All right. Um, Real life computers work like this too, right? Uh, in the sense that you know it is possible for a real life computer to enter an infinite loop. And this is essentially always bad. Uh, it's, it's almost never what you want it to do. But um, mo like most times that your computer appears to freeze and do nothing, it's actually doing something over and over again. Something that is unhelpful and you have to pull the plug or something. Yeah. So do we so are you saying that we don't really need to know the, the union thing? Or we don't need to know the union thing? Like, like I guess, like, what's that doing, I guess? Well, I'm not sure what you mean by that. You should definitely know what this means in this context. Like, what are all the strings that are rejected? It's these strings, and also the empty string, and also A. That's why I use this union. It's this one, and this one, and also all of that stuff. To me, this stuff is the more interesting stuff. These are like individual special cases. Um. Right? If you ask me in words, what are the strings which are rejected? I say the empty string, or just A, or anything that starts with AA, followed by whatever. That's why, that's why it's a union there. Because okay. it represents that, that word or that I was saying. All right. Um, so in the first two cases, uh, or so the language we use for this, here I say accept. This means reject. And then this one is like this, I would say the uh, machine loops. When I say loops, I mean it, it loops forever in, in a sort of unhelpful way, all right? Um, can I say real life TMs that are useful? Real life useful machines in almost all cases are intended to have f of m equal the empty set. Basically on a real useful computer you want it to act like it never loops forever. Uh, that is to say any possible inputs uh, will always result in the computation finishing with some answer. You don't uh, want to have uh, certain inputs which cause an infinite loop. All right, And there's a name for that. So a Turing machine which has no possible infinite loops, actually basically every example we've ever done is like that, where they have no, uh, no inputs which loop forever. Um, those machines have a, a special name. So if, uh, come on, if M is a Turing machine with the uh, looping set, f of m is the empty set. This you, you should regard as like good or, or natural in the real world. This is how we want our machines to, to actually behave. Uh, if you have a Turing machine where the looping set is empty, we say 
M is a total Turing machine. Total Turing machine means there are no inputs which cause it to loop forever. I imagine the word total here means something like it can actually meaningfully give you an answer for any possible input. It, it actually, no matter what input you give it, it either accepts or rejects. It, there's, no, there's no situation which it just kind of like doesn't know what the answer is or something. All right, um, a total Turing machine. And these are the ones when people talk about real world machines, they are intended to be like that. So when it comes to discussing, for example, the limitations, the theoretical limitations of real world computers, most of the time we're talking about total Turing machines because a real world computer is supposed to be something which doesn't have infinite loops. Infinite loops typically indicate that there's a bug in your code or something. So real world uh, computers are meant to be like this. Right? In practice, they are not always, just because people make mistakes. But all right. And there's another word for the language of a total Turing machine. Remember, the language that's accepted by any Turing machine is called recursively enumerable. Um, if uh, L is the language accepted by a total Turing machine, then, unfortunately, this is a deeply unsatisfying bit of terminology. L is called recursive. So you have to remember the difference between recursive and recursively enumerable. Recursive means it is accepted by some total Turing machine. That is a Turing machine which never has infinite loops. That's called recursive. Recursively enumerable means some Turing machine which might have infinite loops can accept this language, all right? So as far as the like hierarchy of languages, we had the regular languages, which include something like A to the N. We had the context-free languages, which includes A to the N, B to the N. We then have the next level out is recursive. These are languages which are accepted by a Turing machine that never loops forever. And what's included in this category is something like, I mean, many, many things, but for example, A to the N, B to the N, C to the N is not context free, but you can make a Turing machine for it, which has no infinite loops. And we've done that example by marking. You mark the A, go down, mark the B, go down, mark the C, and then come back. All right. And then, really what I want to talk about is out here, this is recursively enumerable, which I'm going to write as RE. But are there actually languages out here, but not in here? And then also, are there languages way out there? So in here, this, this area, so RE, but not recursive, what, what would that mean? That would mean it can be accepted on a Turing machine which has infinite loops, but not on a Turing machine without infinite loops. Another way to say that is RE but not recursive means could be accepted by a Turing machine, but it would allow loops, by which I mean infinite loops, all right? That would be a language which you can you can get to be accepted on a Turing machine, but there are necessarily some other inputs that would make that machine loop forever. And then something all the way out here would be something that you, you just simply can't do on any Turing machine. And by the end of the week, we will talk about examples in, in a, each of those two categories. Yeah? So recursive machines like don't even have the capacity to work. Uh, they are Turing machines which happen to have no strings which make them loop. So like every example that we've done before today is, is of that type. That there just are no strings that make them loop forever. But for the, like, are you not recursive? Like, yes. There are strings that make them loop. 
Yeah, that means that this language, you can, you can make a Turing machine that accepts it, but that same machine must allow for infinite loops on some other inputs. Okay. Yeah. It's, you could say something like, if you want to build a machine to make a language in this category, you can do it, but that machine necessarily needs to be so complicated that some other um, strings cause it to loop forever. All right, let's, uh, let's try and talk specifically about this then. So in order to get to these, these wider categories out here, we have to start thinking about um, making variations on a Turing machine that could possibly make it more powerful. So I would like to talk briefly about some simple Turing machine variations. Um, what happens if you give the Turing machine slightly more uh, capabilities? How about, um, what would we get uh, from a Turing machine with two tapes? Surely you can imagine a Turing machine which, in addition to having the one tape, that it uses for everything, maybe you, you will let the machine have two different tapes. Does that actually change the types of, uh, say, does it change the types of functions that we can compute with such a machine? Or does it change the type of languages which you can get to be accepted on the machine? I see some people shaking their heads. The answer is actually this, this would not meaningfully change the abstract capabilities of the machine. If you let it have two tapes instead of one tape, it still will have the same capabilities. And the way that you can see this, I'm not gonna go through a super detailed um, explanation, but a two tape Turing machine, at least on its surface, would seem to be more capable because it can do more. If anything, it could do more stuff. It can't do less than a one tape machine. Um, but a two tape Turing machine could be simulated by a one taper, All right, a one taper. Um, how could you simulate, if you imagine I had a, a, a Turing machine with two tapes, if you, if you could meet Alan Turing and say, hey Alan, I bet you never thought of this. What if the machine had two tapes instead? I imagine he would say, that's a jolly good idea. I don't know, he was British. Um, I imagine he would say, like with two tapes, you, maybe it can be like faster or something, more efficient, but um, it's not going to be able to do anything really special that the first one couldn't. So, and the reason why is because you could simulate a two tape machine using a one tape machine um, doing some kind of uh, product type construction, doing products, right? What I mean by that is if you had, say, a machine with two tapes on it, you know, maybe it said A, B, A, and then a bunch of blanks here, and then you start here in state one, maybe, but then it had some other tape. Maybe the other tape is all blanks. And then it started, say, over here, but in state two, you know, it has a head on each tape, maybe, and those two heads have two different states, and they have, I suppose you would have two different diagrams that tell you how the states of the one head change, and also how the states of the other head change. But doing products like this, this can be combined. Combine it in pairs into some sort of one big tape, which just has, I'm just gonna pair everything up. A comma blank, B comma blank, A comma blank, blank comma blank. I just lined these guys up vertically and paired them up like this. All right, and then your, your head, which was in state one on the first tape and state two on the second tape, might as well be a head which has a pair for its state. And then you can take those two state diagrams and combine them in pairs, just like we did a long time ago with the DFAs. You combine, we call it the product construction for DFAs. You'll want to remember how to do that on the final exam. But anyway, uh, let me just say the, um, the diagram of states becomes more complicated. It becomes a lot bigger because you're gonna make a product.
but it'll still work. We're not actually going to go through the details of this. And there are a few things that you would need to work out that I'm, I'm, I'm making this seem slightly more simple than it, than it really would be to go through the details, but it's not a big deal, all right? Um, and then this one tape Turing machine can do whatever you could, whatever you could do with the two tapes, you can do with the one tapes here, all right? Um, so this product machine, will have the same, what's important about it is it will have the same L of M, R of M, and F of M as the uh, original two tape machine. All right. And so the two tape machine is equivalent to the one tape machine. Anything you can do with two tapes, you can just do the same thing with one tapes, one tape, all right? Um, and this is not just true for two tapes. Really, you can do any number of tapes. You can sort of product them in pairs until you get down to just one tape, all right? So I'm gonna write this um, any, say, N tape Turing machine can be simulated by a one tape Turing machine. And so the moral of the story is a Turing machine doesn't actually get any more powerful if you allow it to have multiple tapes, right? Turing was really into this idea of simulations. Simulating one machine using a different machine became kind of like a philosophical theme um, in, in these things. Uh, probably you've heard of something called the Turing test, which is a test uh, for sort of detecting the presence of a, of a true AI, artificial intelligence. And it involves basically Turing, the question is how do you tell if something is actually intelligent versus um, just like a artificial intelligence. Um, and Turing came up with the idea of, of what we now call the Turing test, which is basically you, um, you take this artificial intelligence and you ask it a bunch of questions, and if it responds to you in a way which is indistinguishable from an actual intelligence, then it counts as real intelligence, whether it's artificial or not. Um, Turing's idea was that um, the ability to simulate intelligence is actually the same thing as intelligence. There is no difference between someone who is intelligent versus a machine which is simulating intelligence. Um, I imagine that opinion came from this, this idea of mathematically two things have the same capabilities if you can simulate one with the other. Um, I actually have an interesting, I don't, I don't like to uh, promote my, uh, my YouTube channel too much, but I have an interesting video about this concept. Um, check it out if you're interested. Watch my video about um, the monkey multiplier. This is a silly, uh, like kids toy that I have in my office, if you're ever in my office, ask me to play with the monkey multiplier, I will happily show it to you. But uh, there are some deep philosophical issues behind the monkey, monkey multiplier which have to do with intelligence versus simulating intelligence, which, um, check it out if you're interested. Or don't, that's fine. What about other variations? How about, um, I'm just trying to think of all the sort of simple ways that you could try to give a Turing machine more capabilities and get something better. Giving it more tapes doesn't actually make it any better. Another variation, how about allowing the head to jump several positions rather than just moving one spot to the left or to the right? I'll say several or no positions in each step. Does that actually give it like really more capabilities? Or could this kind of a thing be simulated by a machine which only moves once, a, once every time? I think the latter is true. This, uh, if you had a Turing machine which is allowed to jump several steps, you can easily just sort of copy that into a Turing machine which moves one step at a time. Um, by just inserting some extra states. Like for, for example, what about, um, let's say our Turing machine can 
stay rather than moving to the left or to the right. Let's say in, in, in some step the machine can stay put. Uh, and if you had that machine, which did something like x slash y comma s, that means in this state, if you read an x on the tape, you change it to a y and stay where you are. Don't change, don't move the head, right? You, it goes to a different state, but it doesn't move the head. That's what the s means, stay. Um, can you simulate this? We can simulate it with a, I would say, normal Turing machine. Uh, by doing something, something like this. How about this? X, Y, R, followed by Y, Y, L. Or, that's not what I meant. This is a machine which stays put. Um, I can simulate this with an ordinary Turing machine by just moving to the right and then immediately moving back to the left. Um, so I would do something like A, A, L, B, B, L, blank, blank, L, etc. Every different letter that you could think of. What this does is it changes the X to the Y and then moves to the right. And then whatever it sees there, it immediately moves back to the left. These two Turing machines, I'm imagining this is just like one little piece of a larger machine, but they have, they have equivalent behavior, right? One stays put in one step, the other moves back and forth, but they, the results will be the same in terms of what strings are accepted, what functions can be computed, all right? And similarly for, for jumping, if you have a machine which, which can jump two, two positions at once, you can simulate that easily by just making two separate motions on an ordinary Turing machine, all right? So I'm gonna say, um, any kind of multi-tape, multi-tape jumping. Can anyone imagine anything else you would want to modify the Turing machine to be able to do? I don't know, how about a Turing machine which, which magically in one step, if you want, could just like pick up the whole tape and reverse it? This too could be simulated by an ordinary turn machine, which would go, it would have to take many, many steps, but it would go through and reverse the whole tape step by step. You can do that, right? Uh, so any multi-tape jumping, did you have another idea of how we can make it better? I think what I was gonna say is like basically jumping. Yeah. Can I just say, et cetera? For now, I'll just say, any kind of extra feature that you can imagine probably would not, would not improve the, um, the Turing machine. Any kind of multi-tape, jumping, etc. Any reasonable, and I, by reasonable, I don't even know exactly what I mean by that, but any reasonable improvement to a Turing machine results in an equivalent machine. Anything you can think of. Now, because I know the future of this course, actually, I can think of an improvement that would result in, a, in a, uh, a, an actually different machine. But it's, it's very weird and it's nothing that anybody in their right mind would think of just off the top of their head. Um, it looks nothing like any of these other ideas that we have. But anyway, any reasonable, I'll put this in quotes, because I have in my mind an unreasonable idea, which actually does change the machine. But, for now, let's just say any reasonable improvement to a Turing machine results in an equivalent machine, all right? And this is why people say things like, a, um, my computer, my real computer, is basically a Turing machine. That's because my computer is not a thing with a tape and a head, but it is somehow, it has many, many things which act like the tape and it has many things which act like the head. And from one step to the next, what my computer does is analogous to a Turing machine with many tapes and many heads that jumps in weird ways. But there are no material differences or from an abstract point of view. This is equivalent to a Turing machine. Um, I would say real computers are fancy Turing machines, but have the same capabilities. They're not actual Turing machines, just because 
There's no such thing really as an actual Turing machine. You can build something with a little tape and a, something or other. But, yeah. Well, does the Turing machine could read multiple states at once, or write multiple states at once? Yes, like several tape locations at once. Yeah. So you could think about what if I have maybe just one tape, but like five different heads on it. This this too can be simulated by a machine with one head. You just if you had five heads before. Whatever they do in one step, you could have done in, in five steps with, with one head that moves in between, right? It would be a lot more complicated, but yeah, that's true. That's a good idea. What about FPGNC light? Do we talk about that? So a, yeah, if you, um, a Turing machine, say, with five tapes, if you convert that down to a machine with one tape, that one tape machine will be far less efficient. That's true. Is that what you meant to say? Yeah, so when I say they are equivalent, I mean equivalent in terms, really specifically, equivalent in terms of these three sets. They are not at all equivalent in terms of their like execution time. Um, it will differ greatly. But from, for the purposes of what, what we're interested in this week, I'm just talking about those three sets, all right? Uh, I, I will just say in, a, in, in very brief terms, maybe some of you have seen this in some of your other computer science classes, but real computers are Turing machines with the same capabilities. Most are based on, um, I mean most real computers that are in use today are based on what's called the von Neumann architecture, architecture architecture. And the von Neumann architecture is a, an abstract description of a machine with certain parts. And it doesn't have a head and a tape, but what, the, the main parts of a von Neumann machine is it has some kind of input unit, which in a real computer would be like the keyboard principally, but also things like the mouse your computer has other kinds of sensors that it can use for input. But, um, and then it has the, co the central processing unit, which is analogous to the head, which takes in input and somehow decides what to do with that input. The central processing unit has access also to the memory, which is kind of like the tape on a Turing machine. Although in a von Neumann machine, the memory does not have to be all like in a line. A von Neumann machine memory would typically be arranged differently in several dimensions, like in, say, two dimensions or, or more. And then uh, a von Neumann machine also has an output device. Basically, every computer that, that people use these days has this general setup, this general architecture to it. All right? Um, and this, the whole point of what I've been saying is before, a von Neumann machine. is equivalent to a Turing machine. Just because it's, it's basically got a very much fancier type of tape and a fancier kind of head, but otherwise it's, it's just a Turing machine. All right, I will say equivalent to a Turing machine, but um, more like useful in the real world to actually use this. You wouldn't really want to use a Turing machine that has a tape and you write a little something on the tape and then it, nobody would want that really. Would you want this? Yes, you definitely want this. You probably have a few of them within a foot of your body right now. All right. Okay. So we've got 10 more minutes. Um, what we have been talking about, this business of simulation is actually, will continue to be important in what we're talking about here. Um, different uh, computers, you know this in real life, can uh, simulate or, you know, it's more often we use this word emulate in this context, one another. My mind was totally blown the first time I saw somebody uh, running Nintendo Entertainment System games on a, on a computer. I was amazed because I had never seen the, the uh, 
I didn't, I was not clear on the concept of emulation. I thought that like the only way to play Super Mario 3 is to put that cartridge into your Nintendo entertainment system. And uh, it never occurred to me that like, yes, obviously you could somehow save the data on the cartridge and run it on something else. Your computer is much more powerful than the entertainment, the uh, NES. So my, you know, my PC can emulate the NES, right? This is true. Um, or many other things. What? Yeah, right. When people, you can emulate a smartphone on a computer or whatever. Like, in, in theory, anything could be emulated on anything else. Sure, you could emulate anything. In fact, your computer could emulate itself, right? You could, uh, this, this, and this is actually, it sounds stupid, but actually that's, that's kind of useful. Uh, running like a virtual machine inside of your own computer. It, that is actually useful for a lot of things. Um, let me just say, PCs can emulate, emulate Turing machines, right? Um, like, people don't, this is not really useful for anything, but there are, for instance, websites where you can go where you can actually like draw yourself a little Turing machine and then hit the button and it'll, it'll run through the Turing machine and tell you if it's accepted or not. Um, and it's not even that hard to do just because a Turing machine is such a primitive kind of instrument much, and even more primitive than the Nintendo Entertainment System, right? Um, people have made a big deal out of this, this idea of one thing simulating another um, and Turing's, Turing's personal life, I don't know if I ever mentioned, but Turing had kind of a tragic uh, personal life. He was gay, and nowadays people uh, have made a big deal out of like, Turing was a gay guy in a time when that was, that was totally unacceptable, and Turing was also like uh, philosophically obsessed with the, the idea of like playing a different role or one thing trying to act like another thing. I don't know if there's really a connection there, but uh, this is the kind of, people, people have said a lot about this sort of thing. I imagine this is what the opera about Turing is about at some level. You can try to play some sort of philosophical games about this, but Turing, um, Turing was gay and then he was sort of found out, he, he was apparently kind of nonchalant about it, and um, he, he was somehow being, being robbed or being harassed by a guy in his apartment. So he called the police and the police showed up and um, Turing was like, you, get, you gotta get rid of this other guy. And the police were like, hold on, are you guys like a couple? And apparently Turing was like, well, yeah, but like, I need to get rid of this guy. And the police were like, whoa, no, 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 no. Um, and he was arrested for being gay, and then um, he was like, they basically said to him, your options are, um, like, you can go to jail, or we can put you on this, um, this, I suppose, like, a, some kind of primitive version of hormone therapy to, like, de-gay you. And he's like, well, all right, I guess I'll take the, take the pills. And they totally messed with his mind, and he ended up, uh, it seems like he ended up committing suicide, or he, he died in, in mysterious circumstances in his own home with, like, he had an apple that was coated with cyanide. Very strange, but a very, very tragic story. And he was eventually, um, very recently, like sometime in the past, uh, 20 years, maybe the past 10 years, the, the British government like officially made an official proclamation that he had been wrongly abused by the government and the government's actions were probably responsible for his death. Um, anyway, that has little to do with what, what we're talking about here, but this idea of Turing being obsessed by trying to play a, play a part of something else, I, I don't know if that's if there's any reality to that, but it's an interesting thing to think about, I suppose. Um, PCs can emulate Turing machines. This is why Turing imagined what he called a universal machine. Which would uh, simulate
other Turing machines. All right. So just like I said, you can run an emulation of your own operating system inside of your operating system, which sounds stupid, but actually there are many reasons why you might want to do that. Turing actually thought about the same thing just with his very primitive uh, universal, or his very primitive machine. He imagined that it could, you could make, using a Turing machine, another Turing machine which would be capable of uh, emulating some other Turing machine. All right? This he called the universal machine. So the idea is this machine, which I'll call U, would take input on the, on the input string of something like M hashtag X, where the M is some binary encoding of a Turing machine diagram. The idea is you take an existing Turing machine and using some, it doesn't matter how you do it exactly, but using some kind of method, you look at the whole state diagram, all the arrows, all the labels on the arrows, and you convert all of that into a big string. When you might as well do it in binary just because that's how we do things some binary encoding of a Turing machine diagram into a string. Then you put the hashtag doesn't really mean anything. It's just a separator that says, here's my machine, and then a separator, and then followed by x, which would be the input string. And then you will run and result in the same output or the same result as M run with input X. All right. So U is a universal machine which takes this as its input, M followed by X. And the whole purpose of U is that no matter what the M is, the U will run the Turing machine M on the input x, and then it'll do whatever the original uh, Turing machine did. This is Turing's idea of the universal machine. And this, this is not very difficult to do. Actually, if you look in our book, they draw a diagram, like an actual diagram for this machine U. It's not that hard, but what's, what's complicated, um, well, they draw a diagram for a machine U which uses three tapes, just for convenience. You could, if you want to, convert that down into a one tape machine. That, that would be a real pain. All right. This U is not, uh, not so hard to construct. And it is this U which is how you get these weird languages. The weird languages um, are about that, uh, that machine U. So I'm just going to say we have just one more minute. We'll get into details about this next time. But I will say at this point, the simplest um, computation which cannot be accomplished on a Turing machine well actually on a total Turing machine that is one which never loops is called this is kind of famous the halting problem the halting problem is if I show you a Turing machine, or equivalently, say, a computer program written in a, in a modern programming language, can you tell me if it's going to halt or not on some particular input? That's the halting problem. And it turns out that is impossible to do on a Turing machine. This is where we're going next time. We'll talk in more detail about that. I think that'll do for today.